And now for your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Thank you, thank you. Welcome to Advanced TV Herstory's special series on TV talk shows. Now, I'll be candid with you. I kind of think I have what it takes to be a good talk show host, except for those pesky connections and the ability to smile through inane small talk. Oh, well, what I think I do have is a keen grasp of American culture and politics, which are aspects that help us better understand and value TV talk show moments. So from context to repercussions, we are going to revisit some doozies. And if you find that you don't recognize the names, or perhaps you do, but you think, wow, obscure, forgotten. Well, you know what? That's the point. We're here to preserve TV history and ensure that these women are remembered. So let's dig in. TV historians, are you worn down by the reality that lies and alternative facts are part of our daily life? That 2023 technology enables people to make deep fake videos and disseminate misinformation in short order? This episode delves into truth and the reputations of two women who were really big deals in mid-century America. Two Dick Cavett Show episodes aired in 1980, and what transpired gives us a time capsule moment that includes the First Amendment, reputation management, and old grudges of strong-willed women. Like something right out of the mud fight heyday of Dynasty, two of the 20th century's most distinguished women writers, Mary McCarthy and Lillian Hellman, dug in their heels in what would become a nearly five-year-long lawsuit over the truth. Mary McCarthy, noted theater and literary critic and writer, guested on The Dick Cavett Show to discuss a new book that she had just written. Cavett was very East Coast. He was urbane. He was an intellectual's intellectual who hosted playwrights and authors and celebrities and politicians to his New York-based show. And they all spoke eloquently and thought deep thoughts. It was usually a late night show. A lot has been written about both Lillian Hellman and Mary McCarthy. Their works remain readily available. And in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they inspired women to write and think and speak their opinions. And that's what made them such a big deal. Find resources about them and this talk show episode in the show notes. And I really, really encourage you listeners to learn a little bit more about each one of them. Do you remember what Mallory Lewis, Sherry Lewis's daughter and Lamb Chop's sister, said last year when when she and I spoke? She said, history is written by the victors. We cannot afford to lose the Lillian Hellmans and Mary McCarthy's and their peculiar lives due to lack of interest. Now, let's look first at Mary McCarthy. She had a lot of opinions. They were nuanced. She was an intellectual to the point of being cryptic. The episodes, The Dick Cavett Show, aired January 24th and 25th, 1980, before the subject of overrated writers came up when she was sitting there with Dick Cavett. She observed to Dick, you know, the Kennedys might be Catholics, but they were not Christians. Wow, that's that's deep. That's deep and kind of mean and judgmental. And this is what was said per a transcript that can be found in Francis Kiernan's 2000 book, Seeing Mary Plain, The Life of Mary McCarthy. And and this is the overrated writer statement that got her into hot water. Cavett had asked her about overrated and underrated writers, which was a prompt that actually Mary McCarthy had asked for as she wanted to plug an up-and-coming author. And instead, she delivers this. The only one I can think of is a holdover, like Lillian Hellman, who I think is tremendously overrated, a bad writer and dishonest writer. But she really belongs to the past, to the Steinbeck past. Not that she is a writer like Steinbeck. And Dick asks, what is dishonest about her? And Mary says, everything. But I said once in some interview that every word she writes is a lie, including and and the. And Dick replies, I'm sure she would write you and correct that. But you wouldn't believe it if she did. Have you ever run into Miss Hellman? And Mary says, I haven't seen her for about, uh, and I never really knew her. I think I met her once. I tell you, it was 1948. That is how long ago it is. Whoa, who was Lillian Hellman that she attracted such vitriol? Well, she was an accomplished playwright, mostly from the late 30s and 40s, who later got caught up in the anti-communist blacklisting. But in January 1980, blind and having suffered many strokes, Hellman's hearing was crystal clear, and she contacted her lawyers the very next day. 
Weeks later, they filed a lawsuit for $2.25 million, about $1.75 for pain and suffering, and a half a mil for punitive damages against these parties, Mary McCarthy, Dick Cavett, his production company, and WNET, which broadcast the Dick Cavett show to public television stations around the country. These women had only been in the same room a handful of times over four decades, and Hellman contended in her lawsuit that McCarthy's remarks were, quote, false, made with ill will, with malice, with knowledge of its falsity, with careless disregard of the truth, and with intent to injure the plaintiff personally and in her profession. So you had the literati, as well as a vast social network of political, journalistic, and just wealthy people of that generation, those born in the first 20 years or so of the 20th century, and they saw Mary's point. Hellman was frail, blind, and unable to control her emotions due to her strokes, and by golly, she had become a bitter, argumentative woman. Some would say more so than she had been in her earlier years. But there were people who could remember that she lied. Now, from this lawsuit, she didn't really need the money. It was more the principle, she maintained. And she did enjoy the fact that Mary McCarthy was a bit on the ropes. She didn't have the money to pay Lillian, should it be settled at that amount, and she could barely afford to hire a decent attorney. Now, Hellman's memoirs have been criticized and corrected for being a total mishmash of facts and falsehoods. And they weren't even necessarily falsehoods about her. They were just made-up stuff. It's a shortcut that seems at odds with her heroic reputation for truth, like when she stood up to the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee in May of 1952. In the mid-50s, Lillian Hellman did something that not many others did. Her stature rose to a level she hadn't experienced in years, refusing to name the names of others who had attended communist meetings had signed petitions, or had socialized with known or even recreational communists, Hellman wrote to the committee chair, quote, To hurt innocent people whom I knew many years ago in order to save myself is to me inhuman and indecent and dishonorable. I cannot and will not cut my conscience to fit this year's fashions, even though I long ago came to the conclusion that I was not a political person and could have no comfortable place in any political group. There was a time in the blacklisting movement that happened in Hollywood and throughout entertainment, that to name names was an act of cowardice. It was to do whatever was necessary to save your own skin. And Lillian Hellman did not do that. And there were a small handful of people who did not do that. Some of them went to jail as a result. And some of them were just simply blacklisted for a decade or more. But you think to yourself, how does a champion of truth and democracy like Lillian Hellman Well, okay, she had found these new audiences for her writing. She was everything. Her memoirs, her teaching. She was at Harvard, and she was witty, and she was a party animal right up until the end. All this success must have driven Mary McCarthy crazy. Now, remember, these were two wildly competitive and complicated women of letters, although it sure seems like it was more of a thing in Mary McCarthy's head than in Lillian's. But Lillian Hellman enjoyed early success as a playwright, And McCarthy, as a critic and writer whose work appeared in magazines and journals consistently for three decades. You can read her work. They mostly traveled, however, in different circles. And world politics seemed to be one of the key wedges that separated them. Hellman was a Stalinist and McCarthy a Trotskyite. As it was revealed over time just how heinous a dictator Joseph Stalin was, Hellman never backed away from 100% support of him. That was a line in the sand. People who normally all thought the same thing found themselves at odds. McCarthy, on the other hand, had a strong background in philosophy, whereas Hellman wrote plays that were progressive and thought-provoking, you know, from her own mind. And they often explored the moral crisis of lying, of fabricating or shading the truth. Isn't that just a bit ironic? But Mary wasn't exactly a homecoming queen either. Many thought of her as a shrill writer who used biting language. She was a product of a Catholic upbringing, and Mary viewed much of the world through a binary lens. True or false, good or bad, right or wrong. But she rose from an impoverished childhood and ultimately made her way to Vassar for her education and was employed as a writer for decades. Also acerbic and opinionated, Lillian Hellman enjoyed holding court with New York's smartest, 
She smoked like a chimney, drank like a fish, and took lovers older and younger than she, despite what many considered a homely appearance. She was the it septuagenarian of the 1970s, and goodness knows we've got a lot of them today, but in 1970, no, that was a novelty. She did a mink ad of what becomes a legend most, if you remember those. So back to Lillian Hellman's lawsuit. Basically, she maintained that she was a private person, she was not a public figure, so as such, she was entitled to claim she was slandered. On McCarthy's side, to her defense, noted journalist and writer Martha Gellhorn researched extensively the basis of the lies statement and detailed the lapses of Hellman's writing, and did so extensively. It's all quite fascinating and a reminder that the viewing public loves a good catfight. But alas, the lawsuit was suspended upon Hellman's death at age 79 on June 30th, 1984. In 2014, nearly 35 years after his talk show aired that two-parter, which became a contentious lawsuit for five years, Dick Cavett went on to star as himself on Broadway and later in a made-for-TV movie entitled Hellman vs. McCarthy. Here it was, this story was going to get told and we would hope, land in history. In researching this recent production, I encountered a number of interviews with Cavett and the actors playing McCarthy and Hellman. It's striking how then 80-year-old Cavett had allowed his opinions of both women to color a story in history that is as much feminist as it is American or literary. He denigrates them both. And I'm going to provide a clip for you from the Theater Talk regional cable show that aired in 2014 with the women leads from Hellman versus McCarthy. And I guess it's he's enjoying the fact that he has outlived everyone and can state his opinions without any challenge and that they still carry weight. Did you have any sense of the animosity between these two women before? I I, I knew enough about them and had read their stuff and so on. I knew that they were politically uh, at odds, Mm -hmm. to put it mildly. And I didn't know as much about what a liar Hellman was until, and I was so sorry when the book Julia got shot down because I thought it was great fun to read. (laughs) Then Ernest Hemingway's former wife, one of them, Martha Gellhorn, a uh, 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 card-carrying Hellman loather, uh, <laughs> did brilliant research work and just about knocked down every single thing in the book that she would. And, and if Lillian had only somehow, and this has to be put down to self-destruction, said, <laughs> okay, it, it's, a, it's a fiction. Uh, I, I thought it might be more fun for people to think it happened or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, she de- continued to deny it. And... Um, she called. Now she called you after the show, right? She did. I didn't. Nobody expected anything. <laughs> and and, and uh, in fact, when I had come off stage in the show, looking back now, you might think everybody's saying, "Jesus, what are we going to do?" Yeah. She said, uh, "Nobody thought anything wrong with anything that was said on the show. It was criticism of a writer by a writer. Yeah. There is, there was then a First Amendment, and there was freedom <laughs> of speech. Although Miss Hillman wasn't that fond of it, though she passed <laughs> herself off all her life oh, yes. as the high priest right. of freedom of our expression, <laughs> and so on. And her famous quote, "I can't cut my conscience to fit the day's fashions." Which <laughs> my friend, the late Jean Stafford, said was not even her line. Oh. It was Hammett's, and she <laughs> broke me yeah. 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 Anyway, but I don't want to besmirch her reputation. <laughs> <laughs> but when Julia was said to be fraudulent from top to bottom. and then He was a 44-year-old white man when the interview took place, and he admits he knew of both women, but didn't really know them. He could not have understood their struggles in the 30s and 40s and 50s trying to be successful writers to be smart women writers, what their pride and their egos and their desires to stay relevant would cause them to do. My bookshelf over the years has held books about and by both women. They aren't characters to be laughed off or demonized or dehumanized even. Sure, this feud that had been brewing, at least in McCarthy's craw, for decades, well, yeah, it did. It spilled over onto his show. But in 1980, when someone called you a liar, you defended yourself. So, listeners, history is written by the victors. And it's kind of amazing how much happened in the 20th century that is becoming lost or rewritten. Hellman and McCarthy weren't saints, but they weren't criminals. They were women with flaws and egos 
and had the privilege of experiencing the American spotlight for a lot more than 15 minutes. We in 2023 are all self-aware enough to learn of these women with an eye to our values, our understanding, and a respect for the inequitable past that women like Hellman and McCarthy struggled and succeeded in. You'll find me shining some 21st century spotlight on them and countless others who influenced us, who influenced our grandmothers and mothers and our aunts. This is why I podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Before you go, please go to tvherstory.com to learn more about us and sign up for our monthly newsletter. Promise not to sell or share your information. Many thanks to Mary Lou Moroz, who has a stronger stomach for Dick Cavett and a better ear for audio than I do. Our jingle is the work of Jazzer from his cut, Take Me Higher, which is found at freemusicarchive.org. Thanks for listening and sharing this podcast with others. 